Dime. All right. So <clears throat> yesterday we started looking at Daniel 11, verse 1 and 2. And <clears throat> I think we, we started touching on verses 3 and 4. So what we identified with 11, verse 1, is 11, verse 1 gives us our starting location. And it tells us through Daniel 10, 1 and Daniel 11, 1, that we're starting our, our count of these next presidents or these next kings in the next verse at the time of the end. So it gives us our starting point. Verse 2 now gives us this information about these kings. And we identified these kings yesterday as de starting from Cyrus, you have Cambyses, Smyrdas, Darius, Xerxes. Then we looked at um, our history where we have Reagan Bush, which is typified by the cool rulership of Darius Cyrus. And this was an election year, as we talked about. So in the same year, there's two presidents. Then we have Clinton, Bush, Obama, Trump, these four. Uh, and it says the fourth shall be far richer than them all. Something we can see very clearly with uh, President Trump. And what we see, what, el what else uh, we saw was in verse 3 and 4, we see we're going to start looking at this transition. And we mentioned this a little bit yesterday that we have the transition from, from Media Persia to Greece taking place in verses 3, uh, three and 4, 2, 3, and 4. And it skips over these nine kings that we talked about. And we saw that that was sim symbolic. It was significant because it makes Alexander the Great, the 10th king, right at the time when the, uh, when the kingdom of Grecia is coming. And we know that Greece is a symbol for the 10 kings. So uh, we saw the significance of that. Does anyone have any questions before we move on with this about what we talked about so far? Okay. Just making sure I'm not losing anyone. Um, so what we mentioned yesterday, uh, just a little bit, was we talked about the kings and we talked about the parallel kingdoms. Now let me see if I can connect these things together for us a little bit. We said that this was the, the south, the, the line of the south, and that this is the, or the stick of the south, and that this is the stick of the north, and that they connect right here at the midnight cry Sunday law time period that this is where these two sticks begin to connect this is where the other flock begins to get called during the midnight cry during the image of the beast test in the United States uh, which takes you to the Sunday law where all the where all the world is going to begin to make their decision uh, for or against uh, the Sabbath and what we want to see what we're specifically seeing in this history with these with these two sticks is this time period marked right here and <clears throat> we're seeing that through this logic, the logic of these two sticks, that this, there's an emphasis placed on the midnight cry to the Sunday law. And what we see is that the transition from Media Persia to Greece is also taking place here in this history. And there's another way to show this, and we'll, uh, we'll look at it now. But this is what we want to emphasize, this history from the midnight cry to the Sunday law. So we didn't really talk about, talk about, normally when I do this, this presentation, I like to talk about Daniel chapter 10 a little bit more because Daniel chapter 10 is talking about the binding off. Are we all familiar with that, at least vaguely? Okay. So I'm going to lay it out and I think we'll understand it. Um, so we have 9-11. Daniel's going to fast for how many days? 21 days, three weeks. So we have 21 days taking us to midnight. And on this day, midnight, or this, this way mark, the 24th day of the first month, I think it is, we have um, this vision. And we know that this is the Mara vision, uh, which is the binding off vision. It's the, 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 the Mare Mara is Christ appearing to you and then you, you responding, which is the Mara. And... We know that Daniel is going to be touched three times. Amen? And this takes us to the midnight cry. Now, so we're all familiar with that structure? Okay. 
So let's talk about this binding off here at the end uh, momentarily. Let's go to Daniel chapter 10 and let's look at Let's look at verse 18. Let's start in verse 18. And Perry, do you want to read verse 18 for us? You can read verse 19. Uh, Catherine, do you want to read verse 18 for us while you're turning there, Perry? Then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me. All right, and then Perry, when you get to verse 19, you can read 19. Uh, 10, 19. So that was the third touch we're looking at right here. So now we're going to, he brings us to our next point. And he said, O oh man, greatly does Fear not, peace be unto thee, be strong, ye, ye, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened, and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Okay, thank you. Uh Joshua, do you want to read 20, verse 20? Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. Okay, thank you. So we see a couple things in these three verses. Each one gives us a different part. So, verse 18 brings us to this third touch. This is the last and final touch of Daniel. Uh, Daniel gets touched. And then it says, the next thing it says to him, be strong, yea, be strong. And what does that take us to? The midnight cry. This is the doubling that takes place here at the midnight cry. Um, <clears throat> this is the doubling that takes place here. Be strong, yea, be strong. And then what does he say? So, Gabriel is standing here at this point, at the midnight cry, be strong, yea, be strong, right after the third touch. And then he says in verse 20, now I'm going to go and I'm going to go fight the prince of Persia, but when I go, the prince of Grecia is going to come. So what he's identifying is the point of transition, the beginning point of the transition from Media Persia to Grecia, which is right, as we were saying before, it's the midnight cry. So from this point forward, Greece, um, Media Persia is going to descend and Grecia is going to rise. And there's some other lines of thought you can look in Daniel, Daniel 11 to show this progressive incline and decline, but we're probably not going to get there. Um, but if, if you look at the history of Actium, if you look at that, it's superimposed here um, at the midnight cry. Uh, but what, what I just want us to see there is that he's placing us this point where Grisha is going to come here at the midnight cry. And we know that, or let me ask you, where does, the, where does the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy end? When does the United States end and the seventh begin? When is that though? What way mark? When the UN takes over, yes, amen. But what way mark is that? The Sunday law, amen. So, at the Sunday law, this is where the seventh is going gonna, is gonna to take over. But as we know, everything's progressive in the Bible. You know, and the, there are very few things that are just right immediately at one moment. Uh, most things take are transition periods. So the, though the, the United Nations is fully set up here, it's going to begin the work of setting up back here at the Midnight Cry. And it's going to uh, slowly or quickly probably, it's going to be a quick transition period to the Sunday law from the midnight cry as the image of the beast is being raised up at this point. Now, another, another line of thought to show this, or when we look at the, the line of, um, what's it called? The line of uh, this, the life of the United States, we know that it goes from the, we talked about this, uh, I think yesterday, it goes from 1798 Seven, oops, 1798 to the Sunday law 
And this is the sixth kingdom right here. And then the seventh is going to take over here. But we see at this point right here, there's this transition. This is kind of what we're looking at. Um, if you wanted to zoom in there. And we talked about how this is the time period where Babylon is going to be forgotten. But here at the end, it's going to sing like a harlot. And it's going to commit fornications again with the whole world. Uh, so this is the point we're focusing on here at the Sunday Law. But what we're seeing is this transition period right before uh, that takes you into that time period. So that's another witness to show that at the midnight cry, um, there's this Grisha begins to come and it's marked in Daniel 10, 20. So going back to Daniel 11, what's really interesting is, is just another, another thought about these parallel kingdoms um, is in verse 4, in verse 4, let me find it. Okay. In verse 4 it says, and when he, Alexander the Great, or the UN, shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided towards the four winds of heaven, and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he, shall, which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up, even for others beside those. So, what I want to show, what I want us to understand, and maybe some of us are familiar about this already, but who is the leader of the United Nations? Both. It's the same answer. <laughs> Anyone? The United States. Uh, the United States was obviously one of the founding members. Uh, we were the ones who really pushed the idea. Interestingly enough, part of the idea was was taken from the papacy. One of the popes at the time, um, uh, he really he had a, a plan, and I think Woodrow Wilson kind of drafted it. Uh, he took that plan and made it into a, a bigger thing. But anyway. Um, the United States is the leader, and, and you hear about it, um, if you've listened to the news at all or anything in the last couple months, there's been several months, you know, almost a year, there's been this tension between the United Nations and the United States, because uh, President Trump doesn't feel that the United Nations has done their part, and if you listen to our ambassador to the UN, uh, Nikki Haley, she's always talking about how we pay more than everyone else in the United Nations just for the disrespect that we get, you know, for, the, for what we put in. Um, so what I want us to see there is that she even admits, and it's just a commonly known fact, that the United States pays most of the money that goes into the United Nations. And so uh, the United States is the one who's in charge of this. And if we look in our notes, the bottom of page, I think we're page four, uh, almost the bottom, where it says the number 10. So Revelation 17, 10 shows us that we have these 10 kings and they're going to reign with the beast for one hour. They're going to reign with the papacy. But has it, have we ever looked at Psalms 83 and uh, Ezekiel 27? Has anyone looked at those before? Okay, I'm not, we're not going to go there, but I will reference them. Um, and I have to remember what Psalms 83 says. <laughs> I'm going to go there for just a moment. Psalms 83 refresh my memory okay <clears throat> okay this is talking about uh, in Psalms 83 if you look in the first couple verses it says um, lo thine enemy have made may Enemies make a tumult, and they, they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come, let us, let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel be, may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one, consulted together with one consent, their confederate against thee. And I talked about this a little bit yesterday, this confederacy that takes place. So these are the nations that come together. And as you go through here, we're not going to go through them, but you can list 10 separate nations um, here. Uh, let me look for there's this. Yeah. So as you go through here, you can list these 10 nations. And there's a little bit of a trick to it because one of them is a repetition. Um, 
and I can show we can talk about that a little bit later. But what I want us want to want us to see is that there's ten nations listed here who confederate together against God's people. And if you t- go to uh, Ezekiel 27, the term "thy merchants" is. If let's go to Ezekiel 27, and we'll just look at that very briefly. Ezekiel 27. This is the uh, this is the um, lamentation for Tyrus. So this is Tyrus being a symbol of the papacy. Tyrus is this city, this coastal city, and all of these different nations were the merchants of Tyrus, and they supported her. But Tyrus is going to get destroyed, and when Tyrus gets destroyed, you have um, you have all of her merchants separating from her, and this is this is actually what what John is quoting from when he is talking about uh, Babylon falling in Revelation 18. He's quoting from Ezekiel 27. Uh, so you have this you have this relationship between the city Tyrus and all of her merchants, and the premier merchant that is listed is Tarshish, and we know that. The ships of Tarshish represent the United States, the economic power of the United States. And Tarshish is the premier symbol, the premier ship in all of these uh, merchants that are here. And there are 10 phrases in this chapter where it says, thy merchants. Uh, Again, pointing us to the number 10 with the United States or Tarshish being the primary premier symbol of those 10. Now, if you look at the symbol of Greece, in Daniel chapter 8, what is the symbol? How does the Bible describe it? Daniel chapter 8. Daniel 8. What's the symbol for, what's the symbol for Greece? A goat. It's a, a he-goat. And what is, what's different about this goat? What does it have? A notable horn. It has this one horn. And what's the one horn versus the goat? Alexander the Great. If you go into the later parts of the chapter, when Gabriel's interpreting this, he says the notable horn is its first king. And this first king is going to be destroyed in, its, in, its, um, in his, Alexander the Great's, uh, kingdom will be divided to the four winds and they go to the the four winds of the world, or goes to the whole world. Um, but what we see is that there's a difference between the goat itself, the body of the goat, and the horn. The horn is Alexander, its leader, but the goat is the empire of Greece. Does that make sense? There's that difference there. So what I want us, what I want us to see is that there's something very interesting taking place here from the midnight, from the midnight, from the midnight cry to the Sunday law, and it's this. The United States is the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy. And the United States is going to lose its sovereignty by the end of that by giving its power to the beast. Just like the whole world is going to give its power to the beast and worship it, so the United States will also do that. In fact, it will be the first one. And that's here at the Sunday Law. But when that happens, the United States just doesn't disappear into history. What happens is it becomes the leader of the ten kings. It becomes the Alexander the Great or the Tarshish to all of these merchants. So it's the United States that is going to be in charge of this, uh, this if I can say it just in the, in the most generic way, the, this new world order that is set up here at the Sunday Law that George Bush was talking about way, or way back here. Sorry, way back here in this history. He's talking about this new world order that's being set up. Um, already back then, the United States will be the leader of it. And they're going to fund it, they're going to be the military muscle for it, and they're going to tell everyone else what to do. And you can see this pretty clearly from Revelation 13, that they dictate to the world and say, you have to make an image to the beast. So, the United States has a dual symbology that's taking place here. You see the fall of the United States as the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy, but you see the rise of the United States as the seventh kingdom, as the leader of the seventh kingdom of Bible prophecy as the leader of the United Nations. So in verse, what is this verse? Oh, I'm in Ezekiel still. Let's go back to Daniel in verse 4, Daniel 11, verse 4. When it's saying, and when he shall stand up, when Alexander the Great stands up, which we're saying is the United States, 
His kingdom shall be broken, the kingdom of the United States will be broken, and shall be divided towards the four winds of heaven. It will be divided to the world. Um, and not to his posterity. It's not going to go to the people of the United States, nor according to his dominion. It's not in the, you know, the boundary of the United States as we understand it, uh, which he ruled during the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy. For his kingdom shall be plucked up even for those beside, even for others besides those. His kingdom gets broken up and it gets divided to the world. So the United States power now becomes a global power. Um, and another thing you can show in this history, and again, we're not going to be able to get there, but I can just at least touch on it, is that from the midnight cry to the Sunday law, and I mentioned the Battle of Actium before, um, you can show that the Battle of Actium ends up being the battle that turns Rome from a republic to an empire. And history no notes it, uh, and it's in your notes somewhere in there towards the end. Yep. Uh, Rome, I'm talking about Rome. Oh. It makes Rome turn from a republic because it was first the Roman Republic and the Roman Republic turned into the Roman Empire. Uh, There's a transition period. Uh, yeah, we're back in history. So, and this is the Battle of Actium that takes place here at the Midnight Cry. And when you look at that history, um, this is the battle where Augustus gets his title of Augustus, soon after this at least, and he's going to um, become the ruler of the Roman Empire and it's no longer the the Republic so there's this transition period from the Republic to the Empire and it's the same thing that happens for the United States the United States is presently a constitutional Republic but from the midnight cry to the Sunday law as we raise this image of the beast we go from a constitutional Republic to destroying and tearing up our Constitution to now becoming this Empire with the rest of the world um, and I know I'm only touching on that briefly, but uh, this is the transition thing that we're, we're seeing here, is that the United States plays a role in the sixth and the seventh kingdom of Bible prophecy. Um, and this is really identifying the, the transition point, or the transition period for the United States to switch roles. Uh, and you can see it, there's, a, there's several different witnesses for that, but those are just a couple. So, now... <clears throat> And we can go. We could go into um, another example of this is that I, I didn't mention is Ahab. Ahab is the the leader of the ten nations of northern Israel, or, or of Israel, um, and so he's the he's the leader of the ten tribes. Um, so you have the one in the ten, so to, so to speak. But he's part of the ten. But he's the premier. He's the leader of it. That's just another example of that, and. Okay, I think that's good for there so far. So what we see so far is what it's really focusing on. The first four verses of this, of this chapter are focusing on the parallel kingdoms, these four presidents, and the history from the time of the end to the Sunday law. Now, I didn't, I'm going to, before I go to the next verses, I want to just talk for a minute about showing that Trump is the last president. I meant to do that yesterday. I forgot about doing it. Um, so let me, let me take a moment and just stay there because I know that's something that uh, is being argued nowadays. So there's, a, there's several different ways to show it, but I want to use Daniel 11 to prove it within itself. <clears throat> so let's... let's uh, if you go back to page 2, of your notes under at the very top it says Daniel 11 verse 2 and then it says Daniel 11 16 to 22 so I want to look at Daniel 11 16 to 22 so Daniel 11 is the best way I can describe it is it's a repeat and enlarge all throughout the chapter it's going to take the same history and just going to tell the same story again and again from uh, different histories and it just keeps repeating at the same, or around the same points, you know, at the similar way marks. Um, so the breakup of Daniel chapter 11 looks something like this. 1 to 4, 5 to 16, uh, 16 to 20, is it 22? Let me look really quick. 
not that I don't trust you. It's either 22 or 23. Um, 20, 22, you're right. 22, 23 to 29, and 30 to 39. So that's the breakup of this chapter. Uh, and it's, we're not going to be able to get through all those histories, but that's the, these are the repeat and enlarges that you see in this, in this history um, as you're looking at it. Um, and what I'm just going to tell you, I'll, I'll tell you this just so it just, if, when you, when you study this out, uh, that this one where we've already looked at a little bit, this one we're probably going to look at, but I will tell you now that it starts in, uh, 538 BC, the application to it, at least the second application, 538 BC, uh, no, sorry, 80, 80, sorry, with the rise of the papacy. This one starts, um, verse 16 to 22, is the four Roman Roman kings. I know they're not kings, but emperors or consuls. So, uh, which is a parallel to verse 2. Verse 23 starts at midnight with the league with the Jews. And verse 30 starts at 9-11. Um, verse 30 is probably my favorite verse in this chapter. It's really cool. It brings in the barbarians um, and it talks about Islam. But anyway, so that's just the breakdown. I forgot to do that earlier um, for all the points that we won't get to, of course. But I want to just talk about this one right here for just a minute. These four Roman kings. So let's go to verse 16. And we're not going to read much of it. Um, because it takes a little bit to get through these verses. But if you read Uriah Smith, who breaks all of this history down really clearly in the CD-ROM, he tells you that, that you end up with these four kings in this time period. And it's these kings right here. It's Pompey in verse 16. Pompey. Then you have Julius Caesar. Caesar, S-A-E, Julius Caesar, then you have Augustus, then finally you have Tiberius. Okay, so these are your four, your four um, kings or four consuls uh, during this time period. Now, Verse 16, it starts off at the, the destruction of uh, Jerusalem by Pompey, or the siege of Jerusalem by Pompey, and then it takes you to Julius Caesar, then it takes you to Augustus, and then it takes you to Tiberius. And I want to focus on 3 and 4 for a minute because there's some really obvious parallels there that we can see. Uh, so let's go to verse 20. So verse 20 is where we start looking at Augustus. And again, you can just look at this from your eye, Smith. He lays out these histories really well and proves why each verse is who they are. Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. But within a few, few days, he shall be destroyed neither in anger nor in battle. So what we've identified is that this raiser of taxes is marking uh, President Obama. And what we saw from Obama is regardless of you know, left or right, Republican, Democrat, you know, it doesn't matter how you look at it. Just the facts of the matter are is that during this time period, there was an increase in taxes drastically over the course of the eight years of his presidency. Um, so that fits very well with the fact that Augustus is a raiser of taxes. And <clears throat> verse 21 is this next person. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person. And this vile person is Tiberius, is Donald Trump. Um, so Trump is this vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom. Now, this is something really interesting that I've always, since we've been looking at this verse, has just struck out to me is that nobody, I have in my lifetime, and I'm assuming it hasn't happened in a very long time, maybe ever, that nobody respects this president, um, Regardless of whether you, you know, you should or you shouldn't, or if he's a good president or a bad president, the fact of the matter is that the United States as a whole, uh, there's this attitude of, 
um, well, he's not really supposed to be there. You know, that he's not fitting of the presidency. Um, and so he doesn't get the honor of the presidency, of that, of that, of that title, uh, regardless of who's in the title. He just doesn't get the honor of it. Um, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flattery. So one of the big, one of the big accusations of uh, Trump when he took the presidency is that he gained it through lies. You know, he gained it through flattering the uh, disgruntled, you know, right, um, and by, you know, making all these promises about all these different things. You know, he made a lot of different promises, and whether or not he kept them is neither here nor there. Um, but the fact of the matter is that he he as prophetically has gained the gained the seat by flattery and so you can see that he's this vile person who doesn't get the honor of the kingdom and he obtains the kingdom by flattery and it fits really well with uh with with that with his presidency so these four presidents are these four these four uh kings line up with these ones here if i didn't say that before i don't know if i did so this is cambyses Cambyses, Smyrdas, Smyrdas, oops, I spelled that wrong. Yep, this is false Smyrdas. Smyrdas, the usurper. What's really interesting about false Smyrdas, um, Darius, Xerxes, one second. So this lines up with, um, this would be, who would we say, Bush? And this would be Clinton. I've always thought it was really interesting. I, I didn't notice it until somebody said it, but false Smyrdas is someone who took the throne by usurpation. And one of the big one of the big accusations of against uh, Bush was uh, was with Al Gore. You know that he stole the election. I don't know if we all remember that. Um, and there was that big uproar about that during you know when it was happening, um, and everyone thought it was you know. It was by fraud, by crook, so to speak. Um, so I just, you know, that's an interesting one. I don't know if you did or didn't, but I just thought that was an interesting connection you see there that false Smyrdas takes the throne um, like that through usurpation. And so people claim that for Bush too. So that's interesting at least. Um, so what I want us to see, so there's this, there's this repeat and enlarge from verse 16 to 22, where again, we see these four Roman presidents or consuls um, and it's important because it's a second witness to these four, first four presidents here that we see in verse 2. And so everything needs to be established with a second witness. And this is the second witness within the chapter that there's these four, these four presidents. So the reason this is so important, and I don't know if anyone really talks about it. I haven't spent a lot of time looking at the arguments of, about why people say Trump's not the last president or whatnot, but I looked at it a little bit, but not in too much depth. But the important one for me is this one here, is Tiberius. Because what Tiberius does. So let's read the next verse. Verse 22. And with arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him, and, sh and shall be broken, yea, the prince of the, yea, also the prince of the covenant. Now, when Uriah Smith comments on this, he very quickly identifies that the Prince of the Covenant is who? Who's the Prince of a Covenant that gets overthrown? You don't remember? This is Christ. This is Christ. This Christ is the Prince of the Covenant, um, also described as the Messenger of the Covenant uh, in other parts of the Bible. So, this is the cross. This is the cross that's happening. And the cross, verse 21 and 22, are both under the time period of Tiberius. Tiberius was the, was the emperor when Christ is crucified. So, Tiberius is known for the cross. Obviously, he didn't do the cross. It wasn't his fault, but it was during his time period. Um, and it, it is, the blame is given to him in the Bible here, so to speak, in verse 20, 22. So let's look at it. What is, this, what is the cross? We talked about this last, yesterday. What, what way mark is the cross? Those who choose Barabbas are choosing what? The Sunday law. They're choosing Sunday over Sabbath. Uh, so the cross is a symbol of the Sunday law. 
Amen? This is the Sunday law. So what does that mean? If Tiberius is connected with the Sunday law, then that means, and, and Trump is the fourth president that lines up with Tiberius, then that means Trump has to make it all the way to the Sunday law and be there present for the cross or the Sunday law. So there can't be another president before the Sunday law. The Sunday law has to come. At least you have to be at the Sunday law where Trump can be responsible for it uh, or else you won't, you won't be fulfilling the prophecy that Tiberius is there because what people are saying is that sure you have Trump, you have Pompey, Julius Caesar, Augustus Trump, and then you have a person right here. And these people are saying it's going to be, I think they're saying Hillary Clinton or something like that. She's going to rerun or I don't know how they're saying it, but um, I think they're saying it's going to be a Democrat. But my point is this. Nowhere in chapter 11 do you see a fifth king. And when you see this fourth king, it's connected, this fourth king is connected with um, two things. One, he's connected with the Sunday law through the cross because Tiberius is the one who puts Christ on the cross. But he's also connected with, and this is a little bit harder to show and I'm not going to show it right now, but you can show that this is, um, this is, this has to be Alexander the Great. Um, and so Alexander the Great is again the one who's present at the transition from the 6th to the 7th kingdom of Bible prophecy. So what we're seeing here is that there's no biblical justification in Daniel chapter 11 for a fifth king. You have to be ending at this, this fourth king. If there is a fifth king, it would be after the Sunday law. And if it's after the Sunday law, it doesn't matter uh, by that point. It's not a prophetic, you know, it's, it's not prophetically significant at that point because everyone has pretty much already uh, closed their probation. Um, so that's my, that's a brief explanation about why I think it's unbiblical to say that there will be another one. There will be a 46th president. Um, and, okay, so let's continue. Does that make sense? Does anyone have any questions on that? Okay. So let's go to, we're going to go to verse 5. <clears throat> so this is going to be hard. This is going to be hard because I don't have a lot of time left, and this is a huge, a huge bit of information that we're going to about to talk about. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to read anything uh, other than just to refresh my memory. Um, I'm going to just lay out the line so you can see it, and the notes are very self-explanatory. And I'll try to explain the connections so that when you read through those notes and you read through the history, it will make a little bit more sense. Because I'm positive that. If I wasn't familiar with the history of Daniel 11 all the way through that, I don't think everyone else is too. It's a, it's, you know, there's a lot of history there. Um, unless everyone, I'm assuming everyone's probably a better scholar than I am with this thing. But, so let's go to verse, let's go to verse 5 for a moment. And the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, he shall be strong above him and have dominion, and his dominion shall be a great dominion. So before I read that, let me just mark, make a line. Let me make two lines. Okay, let's go down here. So the top line is going to be our historical line. And the bottom line will be our application line. And I'll try to just lay out the history really briefly of, on the top line, and then I'll come back through and we'll do the, the second line. Um, and let me pull up my notes again really quick so I can follow along with that. And as, you, as you're looking at your notes, you can follow along. We're going to start on page bottom of page 4, and we'll go through that. Okay. So... It begins with verse 4 and 4 and 5. And 4 and 5 is the dividing of Alexander the Great's kingdom. It's broken up into four kings, uh, four kingdoms. And the kingdoms are the four winds. You have north, south, east, and west. And 
you have uh, you have Seleucus. I'm just going to put Seleucus in the south. You have I'm going to forget all of these. One second. Okay, you have Cassander. You have where's Cassander? I forget. Okay, so you have. Oh wait, you guys already let me screw it up. You, you, you already let me show. You have Seleucus in the east. You have Ptolemy. Ptolemy in the south. And Lysimachus, I think. Oh, this one always. Lysimachus and Cassander. It's in here somewhere. I normally am good at remembering this, but it's been a long time since I've looked at it. Um, if anyone can remember. Oh, here it is. I got it. Lysimachus had the north. Lysimachus. I'm going to put an L for Lysimachus and a C for Cassander. So what happens is this. <clears throat> okay, Cassander. Cassander gets conquered. The West gets conquered by first by Lysimachus. So then Lysimachus takes down the West. So you have West, North. So now you actually only have three kings. And so Lysimachus is in charge of the North and the West. And then Seleucus comes over a little bit later, and he takes out Lysimachus. And it looks like you end up looking like this by the end. By verse 5, it ends up looking like this. So it's split up into four sections, and then these, these kings battle it out, and Ptolemy kind of stays out of it for a while. But you end up with Ptolemy versus uh, Seleucus here. And Seleucus has the north, west, and east under his belt while Ptolemy has the south. So if you go to verse verse 5, that's what verse 5 is talking about. And the king of the south shall be strong. Ptolemy in Egypt, the king of the south shall be strong. But one of his princes, he shall be strong above him and have dominion. And his dominion shall be a great dominion. So Seleucus is the, was one of his princes. Ptolemy was a general, and Seleucus was under Ptolemy. And Seleucus, uh, Seleucus breaks off from Ptolemy. Actually, I think they made an agreement, if I, under if I understand the history correctly. They made an agreement, and Ptolemy took the east for, or sorry, Seleucus took the east for himself, while Ptolemy stayed in Egypt. And so, Seleucus was one of Ptolemy's princes. And what happens is that he ends up becoming greater than his former master, and so you have Seleucus versus Ptolemy now, and all the other generals are dead, the other two. And you have this king of the south, king of the north dynamic going on. So notice, just for, uh, and this is in the year, I think this is 281. Is that what it's saying in your notes? Yeah, 281. This is the year 281. And what Seleucus does, BC, is he takes three kingdoms. Ptolemy is going to, or it's not Ptolemy, Seleucus is going to take these three kingdoms, and Seleucus is the king of the north. So let's just remember that for a little bit. But it's still in contrast with the king of the south. They're both there. Now there's going to be a battle. There, there, sorry, there are multiple battles that take place, multiple wars between the king of the south and the king of the north from this point forward. And then it says this, And in the end of years they shall join themselves together, for the king, king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand, nor his arm. But she shall be, but she shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that begot her, and he that strengthened her in her in these times. Okay, so let's summarize that briefly. After Ptolemy takes these three locations and is in contrast with, I'm going to do this the whole time. I'm going to keep mixing them up. Ugh. After, and I'm going to confuse you and I'm going to confuse myself. So after, but, but I know what I mean. Seleucus takes the king, takes these three locations. Seleucus takes these three locations, these, the north, west, and east. And he's now in contrast with Ptolemy. And they begin to war against each other for a long time. But it says in the end of days, or the end of years, sorry, they're going to join themselves together. So right, right here at the... Um, Right here, they're going to make this treaty. There's a treaty here. And what happens, treaty, 
what happens is the king of the south sends his daughter to the king of the north. And her name was Bernice. And so Bernice goes to the king of the north. But at this point, and what you need to understand about this history is it's not going to be Ptolemy and Seleucus the whole time. They're, they're, they're going to die and then their sons are going to take over and their sons' sons. And we're going to have different kings. So I'm going to say is the king of the north and the king of the south for most of it even though these are different people over a couple hundred years. So the king of the south and the king of the north make a treaty. The king of the south sends his daughter to the king of the north. Daughter. And they go into a marriage, but salute. But the uh, king of the north is already married. And his wife at the time is Laodice. Uh, and she gets, she gets outed, not outed, she gets... Um, What's the word? She, he, he sends her away. He banishes his wife for this, for, this, uh, for this daughter because he has to make this political alliance to stop the war. So he sends his wife away, Laodice. And Laodice gets sent to, I think it's Antioch, if I remember correctly. So we have Laodice, comes down here. She's all sad because she got, she got kind of deposed. She got banished from the kingdom. So Bernice is here with the king of the north, but after a certain amount of time, um, the king, the king of the north up here decides, you know what? I don't want to be with Bernice anymore. I miss my actual wife. And he says, he says, okay, Laodice, you can come back. And so Laodice comes back and what she does almost immediately, very quickly, is she kills the king. She says, I'm never going to be, I'm never going to be banished again. This is never happening to me again. So she comes back, kills the king and she kills, um, Bernice runs. She, she runs to some other, some other uh, town or city or something like that. She runs away uh, after the king dies. And so she gets out of there. She escapes for a minute. And Laodice now puts her son. She puts her son. I'm going to read Ptolemy. I'm just going to have, uh, let's just do this. So we have north and south. Laodice now puts her son on the throne. And... Um, what's going to happen is that she's, she's now, now she and her son are ruling and they go find Bernice. She, Bernice is over here somewhere in this, in this town and they go find Bernice and kill her. But before she dies, she sends out a letter. She sends a little letter back to her, her family in, uh, Egypt. And she says, send help immediately. I'm in great danger. Um, Laodice has gone mad, <laughs> you know, she sends this message. And so they don't get there in time and Bernice gets killed. So we have this, this, uh, this struggle and now Laodice is dead, or sorry, uh, Bernice is dead and the king of the south is mad. So the king of the south says, you broke our treaty. We gave you, our, we gave you our, this, this daughter. It was supposed to work out, but you broke the treaty. So we're going to use that as a justification to go to war. So now the king of the south uses this as a justification, and we see right after this treaty is broken, the first war, uh, the first war since the treaty. And this war is marked in verse, um, <clears throat> one second. This is verse, this is Seleucus Kaling, 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 I always forget how to say the name, but this is another Seleucus, it's one of his sons. Um, anyway. So, this is verse, where are we? This is verse 6. Uh, this is verse 7 now. But out of the branch of her root shall one stand up in his estate, in which shall come with an army, so he's going to come and retaliate, and shall enter into the fortress, and the king of the north shall deal against them, and shall prevail. So, um, into the sorry into the king king into the fortress of the king of the north and shall deal against them them being the king of the north and shall prevail and shall carry away captives into Egypt their gods with princes and with their precious vessels and silver and gold and he shall continue more years than the king of the south okay so the king of the south shall come into his kingdom and shall return into his own land so that's this is a section of time uh, I gotta find the year let me just write the year down this is. 246, and this is called the Laodicean, Laodicean Wars, or the Laodicean Wars, which is kind of neat, you know, you have Laodicea there, 
So we have this war here in 246, and the king of the south, I'm going to just do a little uh, south over north, and the king of the south wins, king of the south loses at this point, and what we need to, what we need to see here is that the king of the south is described in this history as the benefactor, because he's going to take like 2,500 images of their gods back from the king of the north that they lost and bring them back to uh, their nation in Egypt and he gets, you know, he gets all this honor and these riches because of that, because he did that work. Um, he brings back all these idols. So that's what takes place there. Um, and I know I'm going fast, but you, it'll make a little bit more sense as I go through the repetition here momentarily. I um, mean, you have all these historical notes in your thing. I laid them out um, for each section. I have the type and the anti-type. Um, so this brings us to verse 10. And, and as I mentioned yesterday, Daniel 11 is just, a, it's a, a tip for tap. The king of the south does something, the king of the north retaliates. The king of the north does something, the king of the south retaliates. So this is the retaliation. But his sons, the sons of the deposed king of the north, or the killed king of the north, shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. Then shall he return and be st stored up even to his fortress. So we come to this point here where the king of the north is going to be victorious over the king of the south. And what happens here is that, and this is in the year, this is 222. We have these two brothers. This is this is Antiochus Magnus and Seleucus Serenius, these two brothers. But Seleucus Serenius is the older brother, I believe. He's the older brother, and he gets put in charge of the armies. And he gets uh, killed by one of his generals because he's a bad general. He's a bad leader. Uh, and they put Antiochus Magnus as the leader of the armies. And now Anti Antiochus Magnus is ruling this great army, and he goes and he makes war. So what we see here, what we see here is that, and it, this is a really simple verse because there's these two brothers, and I want to emphasize that we have these two brothers, two brothers, and they're going to go to war in 222 BC, and it's as simple as the king of the north wins and the king of the south loses. Pretty simple verse. Verse 11. Uh, actually, there's something we need to see here, though. Sorry, before I go any further. Notice how in verse 10, it says, And he shall return and be stirred up even to his for fortress. But the king of the south, in verse 7, it says, And he shall enter into the fortress. So there's a difference in the, in the verbiage of this fortress. And let me explain what we're seeing here. Um... You have the you have the king of the south. This is verse, what verse did I say? Seven. This is verse seven. This is what the king of the south does. This is the fortress of the king of the north. And the king of the south is going to come into that fortress all the way in. And he's going to conquer him and he's going to come out. And then he's going to leave. He attacks and then he leaves. Verse 10 what happens in verse 10 is that the king of the south has a fortress. And what happens is the king of the north comes, but he ends at the fortress. He takes all this land outside the fortress, but he leaves the fortress itself. And then he's going to leave as well. He'll return back to his own land. So the, king, the thing that we want to see here is that the king of the, king of the north gets his fortress uh, destroyed, you know, the king of the south goes all the way in, but the king of the north in this time period only goes up to the fortress. And that's important for uh, a little bit later, and we'll look at that. So, and the history behind this one is that in this history here, in this history, the king of the south goes all the way into the capital city of Seleucia, and deposes or kills, literally kills Laodice and her son. But in this history here, you have um, you have the you have Antiochus Magnus, and he takes all the land that he lost in the previous previous war. But 
he doesn't go all the way into Egypt like the other, like the king of the north, like the king of the south goes into all the way into Syria. So he kind of just stops at the border of Egypt and says, okay, I've taken enough land. I'll leave Egypt and I'll just stop here. Uh, so we need to see that distinction here for a moment. You might be right. I'm not sure. I know that I know that there's two other brothers uh, to the the killed king, and they escape, and they go somewhere. They're off in uh, exile, and they're the ones. They're they're Seleucus Serenius, and that's Antiochus Magnus. But I forget what actually happened to the son. You might be right that he goes into captivity. I always, I I never remember that detail. Um, and maybe it's in there in the notes, and I just I keep looking over it. Um, but Laodice for sure does get killed. So this takes us to verse 11. And the king of the south shall be moved with Kohler. So now there's the retaliation. And so we have the king of the south is going to be victorious over the king of the north. And verse 11. And the king of the south shall be moved with Kohler and shall come forth, with, forth and fight with him, the king of the, king of the north. Even, even with the king of the north, and he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. And he shall cast away, and he, sorry, and when he hath taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up, and he shall cast down many ten thousands, but he shall not be strengthened by it. For the king of the south shall return, and shall set forth a great, a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and with much riches. So we see these last two battles here between the king of the north and the king of the south. And the first one, the king of the south is going to come. He gets angry. He's moved with choler, and he defeats the king of the north, and then his heart get heart gets lifted up. But then the king, then later, the king of the north is going to retaliate, and he's going to wipe out the king of the south. So, let's just grab those years really quick. So these are the battles that we talk about often. These last two. This is the battle of uh, Paneum and Raphia, or Raphia and Paneum rather. Two seventeen. Two seventeen B.C. This is Raphia. Yeah, and this is Paneum in the year. I've always put a year down for the Battle of Paneum, but the problem with the Battle of Paneum is nobody really agrees exactly when it was. And I'm going to put the year 200. You know, I might step on people's toes by putting the year 200. Uh, some people say it was in 198. Some people say it was in 200. Um... It ends up mattering for other reasons, but, uh, you know, for right now, there's Raphia and then Paneum. It's that simple. Um, so there's some interesting details about Raphia, and it's this. Once he defeats, once the king of the south defeats the king of the north, the king of the south is then moved with, with uh, his heart is lifted up, sorry. His heart is lifted up, and he goes to Jerusalem, and... He wants to enter into the, the most holy place, into the temple. And we, as we know, that, that's not permitted for a, a Gentile to go into the temple at all or even into the area. But then even more so, it's not permitted for someone who's not like the high priest to go all the way into the most holy place. So what happens, there's this story that the king of the south at this time, uh, he goes into the, he goes into, I think, the holy place. And he's on his way to go to the most holy place. And somehow he gets struck down now the the story says that he's he's knocked unconscious and he's brought to his feet literally to the ground um and uh and they have to drag him out of the temple you know his guards that are with him they bring him out of the temple and they uh bring him back to bring him back to egypt and when he gets back to egypt he just goes straight back at that point when he gets back he's so mad at the jews that he begins to persecute them in Alexandria. And he makes these laws to persecute them and a bunch of people end up dying. Um, there's this great persecution. And that's what's being discussed in, in verse, what is that, verse 12, when it says his heart shall be lifted up because of his victory. He'll try to go into the most holy place or into the temple and he shall cast down many ten thousands. 
these many ten thousands or many ten thousand Jews um, that get persecuted during this time. And then verse 15, verse 13, 14, 15 takes you to Panium. And it's really simple. There's this space of time between where they make a treaty. And then finally you have the Battle of Panium where uh, the King of the South is defeated. And there's a lot of details there. So let me go through this history really quick and just lay it out. Because this template here becomes the, the template for the rest of Daniel 11. Everything else is going to fit inside of this structure here. Um, and it just builds on top of it. And it proves the points that you see here. So let's look at the application now for a moment. 281, we see that the king of the south, king of the north, sorry, takes three kingdoms. And this brings us to the application of 538. The king of the north, uh, the papacy, is going to take three geographical, loca three geographical locations. Uh, three, um, five, oh, sorry, sorry, 538. Uh, AD, three great geographical locations, and um, that looks like a six. I promise it's a G. It says three G. Three geographical locations, three three kingdoms. And what's his what's what's it described as? It's described as a great dominion. So this great dominion is akin to uh, is akin to the papal supremacy from from 538 and let me just look for something one second <clears throat> yeah this is uh, oh, where is it okay yeah this dominion is described as um, this dominion is is showing the is showing the papal superiority during this time, supremacy, um, where he has this great dominion, and at the end of his great dominion, he's going to be brought down. Uh, but before he does, at the end of days, which I'm suggesting is equivalent to the time of the end, before the time of the end, in 1798, right before it, um, the time of the end, there's going to be a treaty between the king of the south and the king of the north. Now, does anyone know this treaty? Um, this treaty... What? I guess both. It's in your notes, so you probably already cheated by now. This is the treaty. Um, yeah, this is the treaty of 1797. This is the treaty of Tolentino. 1797. And what happens is the papacy... The king of the north in France, atheistic France, were at war with each other for a little bit. And they make a treaty to stop the hostilities. And this treaty is akin to the treaty that, um, that uh, is marked in the scriptures here, this peace treaty where they, the daughter is given. So they make this peace treaty. And what happens is that France, some, some French ambassadors and a couple people, important people, go to, uh, they go to Italy. And they get killed in some sort of riot. And so what happens is France says, hey, you broke the treaty. Uh, you broke the treaty and now we're going to attack you because you broke the treaty. And what happens is they, they, this is after that treaty is broken, then the papacy is taken captive like that next year, uh, that next spring. It's right in the spring. I think it's around February um, where a couple months later uh, by birth year. So the same thing happens here that happened in this history. They make a treaty, and the king of the north breaks the treaty somehow. In this point, they killed Bernice. In this point, they killed an ambassador. And the king of the south uses that as a provocation to take out the king of the north. So France is going to take the pope captive in 1798. And notice how it says in this history that the king of the south enters into the fortress. So... Berthier goes all the way into Vatican and takes the Pope out of Vatican, brings him back to France, and takes him captive. Now notice we also talked about how uh, the King of the South in this history was described as the benefactor for taking all these images and these vessels back to Egypt. Well, part of the treaty here in 1798 was that uh, France, because France was such a bigger power than Italy, than the, the Papal States at that time, uh, they could push him around a little bit. And what happens is um, 
France says, not only do we just want a peace treaty and you're going to let us go wherever we want, but you're going to let us take whatever art of yours we want without question. If we want to take Michelangelo's whatever, you're going to let us take it back with us. And they, they agree. So then France begins coming into Italy for the couple months that they had this treaty, you know, uh, alive. And um, they take all this artwork. And this is where museums come from, from all the art uh, that was taken from um, was taken from Italy in that time. They bring it back to France. They bring it to the Louvre, and the first uh, the first museum is made, which is kind of kind of cool. Um, but anyway, so in both histories, they end up taking these precious vessels, these these artworks, you know, these idols, uh, back to the King of the South's territory. In this case, France, and in that case, it was uh, Egypt. So there's again that same thing there. And this takes us to our next point where you have where you have these two brothers. Now this is the retaliation for this event here. Now remember, we've already talked about this. When does the Pope, when does the King of the North, the papacy, retaliate for the work that was done in 1798? We talked we talked about it a lot. Over the last day. Yep. 1989. This is this is all Daniel 11 verse 40. So in 1989 we see the retaliation. Uh, again, this is also the time of the end. Um, so we have the retaliation here. And notice we had these two brothers that come against the king of the south and uh, defeat him. And they only go up into the kingdom and we'll talk, or they only go up into the fortress and we'll talk about that in a minute. But what two, what two presents do we have here? 1989. Reagan and Bush. So we have these two brothers here and we have these two presidents here. So there's that parallel there, which is interesting. And in 1989, through the Solidarity Movement, the United States and the papacy conquer the Soviet Union but they don't go all the way into the fortress. They stop at the fortress. Now let me show you what that looks like. This is Russia. And I'm famous for my squares because it's the only thing I can almost draw. <laughs> so this is Russia. This is Heartland uh, Russia. This is Europe over here. Uh, they, through the Solidarity Movement, they start, you know, picking away at all these different countries. It was a social movement. And what happens is the borders of the Soviet Union get dissolved from all the buffer they, room that they had over here to just Russia, just mainland Russia. They lost all of their countries. Um, and now the king of the, king of the south, but, but sorry, so from now they lose all these different countries, but Russia remains, the heartland of the, the heart of the Soviet Union remains. They have social reform and everything, and there's this cultural cultural shift. But anyway, they lose everything they had outside of Russia, and then these European, you know, the 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 flood of of, uh, of solidarity kind of goes backwards, and they all go back, you know, and uh, what ends up happening is the King of the North only takes all the way up into this point here, up into Russia, and they leave Russia. Um, so that's important because it, the king of the king of the South did the exact opposite, not the opposite, but he did. He went further. He went all the way into the fortress. So there's a characteristic there that we need to see that's different between these two histories. Uh, and the reason that is important is because this is what establishes the idea that Russia is still a player of Bible prophecy because we never dealt with them in that point. They were never given a deadly wound like the papacy was. And what the papacy does is he revives, you know, almost miraculously um, as the eighth kingdom of Bible prophecy, but he was given a deadly wound here. Russia never received a deadly wound. He just got wounded, uh, just not mortally wounded. So that's why we have these last two battles of Raphia and Panium. And what we understand is that this is midnight and this is the midnight cry. Um, so what we're predicting is that, and I, I'm not going to get into all the intricacies of these points right now just because of time, but uh, what, we're, what we're showing or what we're predicting is that the king of the south 
Russia is going to win the battle at the midnight cry at midnight and the United States is going to retaliate at the midnight crime. There's a lot of lines within Daniel 11 that show that uh, the same structure. Um, and what else? So another neat thing about this, another neat thing about um, going into the fortress, I'll end with this one, with this last point. <clears throat> so let's go to, let's go to Isaiah 7 for a moment. So, Isaiah 7, and we'll look at verse, verse uh, 8 and 9. Let me erase some of this. So the context of this is that there's this evil confederacy against uh, Judah, against Israel. Well, I need to be specific. Against Judah, the king of the south. Or sorry, not the king of the south. The um, this evil confederacy against the southern tribes. Uh, where Israel, the northern tribes, gangs up with Syria and some other nations. And they're going to attack Judah. And it's going to come to naught. Uh, but what we see is this prophecy that's made uh, in Isaiah chapter 7. So there's this evil confederacy and they're looking to take on Judah. But we want to pick out this thing in verse, in verse 8 and 9. It says, the head of Syria is Damascus. So we have Syria. Syria. And the head of Syria, um, here we'll do it this way. We have, this is it. My other famous drawing is stick figures. Um, so this is Syria. And the head of it is Damascus. Now, does anyone know what Damascus is to Syria? Capital? It's capital. It's just the capital city. So you have Syria, and the head of Syria is Damascus. And it says the head of Damascus is resin. So... What it does, there's, and there's another thing you can show, this is important for this statue of Daniel chapter 2, but it's saying that you have Syria, and the head of Syria is the capital, and the capital city is Damascus, and the head of the capital is Rezin. Rezin is the king. So the king is head of all of this, is the is head of all of Syria. Um, but we want to look at this separ separation between all of Syria and Damascus, the capital. So then it says in the next verse, the head of Ephraim, the, sorry, the head of Ephraim is Samaria. And this is the same thing. Uh, we have our guy. And the head of it is uh, Samaria. 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 And this is Ephra Ephraim. And Ephraim is just another word for, does anyone know? Israel. It's just another word for Israel. So these are the northern tribes. The northern tribes are described as Ephraim, and the head of Ephraim is again the capital city of Samaria. Um, so it gives us this distinction between the head and the body. And that's what I want us to see there. Does that make sense from these verses? We see that? We have the head and we have the body. So let's go to chapter 8. So speaking of this confederacy again, let's start in verse 5. The Lord also spake unto me, saying, For as much as this people refuse, refuseth the waters of Shiloh, that go softly, and rejoice in resin in Remaliah's son, now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria, and all his glory, and he shall come up over all his channels, and go over all his banks. So we're seeing that the king of Assyria is going to do something. And it's going to, the king of Assyria is going to rise over the banks. He's going to, he's going to, in the next verse we're going to read, he's going to overflow. Verse 8, and he shall pass through Judah and he shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck and the stretch and stretching and the stretching out of his wings shall 
fulfill the breath of thy land, O Emmanuel. So what happens is that, back to the square, this is Judah. And in the middle, and it might not be historically or geographically accurate, but you have Jerusalem. And then you have, you have, my stars are just little, all these other little towns, you know, cities or whatever that are around it. So you have all these other cities around it, but you have Jerusalem, and we know that Jerusalem is the capital of, of Judah. So what's going to happen is the king of Assyria, in this evil confederacy of Isaiah chapter 7, is going to come down, and he's going to conquer all of these different, all these different uh, towns. And we can see the fulfillment of this in, do I have it here? Chapter 36. Let's just jump to 36 and we'll come back here in a minute. Isaiah chapter 36. So this is a prophecy. It didn't come to pass in that moment. It was, a, it was future tense. Um, so in chapter 36, we see this. Now it came to pass in the 14th year of, the king, of king Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all of the defense cities of Judah and took them. So this is chapter 36. Uh, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, is going to come and he's going to take all of these little towns, these defense cities, and he's going to he's going to come to Judah, uh, come to Jerusalem now, and he's going to stand right outside of Jerusalem, and he's going to make all these, he's going to use all this profanity, and he's going to make all these haughty statements against God, um, and this is Sister White calls uh, calls Sennacherib the haughty Assyrian. And does anyone know what happens to Sennacherib's army as they're standing outside of Jerusalem? They, they get called back. They get uh, distracted by the music or, you know, I just know that they... Is, it, is this the one where they get distracted or is this the one where they get killed? I might be mistaking my history. Somebody find that out. Either they get killed or they get distracted, one or the other. Um, but anyway, regardless of what's about to happen is... They're standing outside of Jerusalem and they're ready to take it, but something happens. And we're going to figure this out in a moment. <laughs> but they're going to, uh, from my understanding, I thought they got killed. I thought this is where the angel comes and they, um, and all of them get massacred in the night or they kill each other. But someone, someone correct me if I'm wrong about that. I might have the wrong history. Um, but regardless of what happens, they stand outside of Jerusalem and they say, we're going to conquer you now. We've conquered all the other cities we're going to conquer you. And what ha something happens and they have to retreat. They go back into Assyria. And, Jerus and Judah loses all of the cities except for Jerusalem. It's the only one that doesn't get conquered. Um, and as we said, based upon our model here, if we did this, we have Jerusalem is the head. Um, Jerusalem is the head of Judah. So what the prophecy says in chapter 8, if you go back to chapter 8 for a minute, uh, chapter 8 in verse 7 and 8, it says the king of the Syria is going to come, it's going to overflow, and it's going to pass, uh, it's going to overflow the banks, and it's going to pass over Judah, and it's going to reach even to the neck. So it goes right up into the neck, which equals all of Judah except for Jerusalem. Do we see that? Does that make sense? So this is in the, and what we're seeing is we're seeing that Judah, the, what we're looking at here is that Judah is a similar, is a representation of the way that the papacy conquered, um, uh, what's it called? Russia. It went even to the neck, but it didn't actually take out the capital, which was Russia. You have this whole Soviet Union and you have, the overflowing happening of Daniel 11, verse 40. And in verse 40, it says it's going to overflow and pass over over all the countries, but it doesn't take out Russia. It just takes out all of the, all of the body of Russia, if that makes sense. So I want us to see that connection here, that this is, it's biblical. Uh, we have this biblical witness with Judah that the same thing happened where they lose all of their territory except for the capital and it's described as the overflowing and the passing over. Yep. You're right. Oh, I'm right. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Just making sure. Uh, 
sometimes I mix my Bible stories. <laughs> okay, so do we see that? Does that make sense? Did I do that too fast that it didn't? Okay, so it's really, uh, that's a really important thing because it allows us to see the fact that Russia is still a player in Bible prophecy because it only went up to the neck and the waters abated and now the king of the south is ready to do its work again and that's what happens here at midnight is it's the retaliation for the work that the United States did here in 1989. Um, and so that, that is that. Does anyone have any questions? Um, in verse 16, just takes you to the Sunday Law. It's a really easy verse to see. It's the destruction of uh, Jerusalem by Pompey, where he sieges it. Um, and that's easy. Rome, Rome sieging Jerusalem is an obvious symbol for the Sunday Law. And we've talked about that a couple times the last couple days. Uh, okay. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this time that we've had this weekend. We thank you for the studies and for the fellowship. We thank you for uh, everything you've done for us, Lord, and the traveling mercies that you've provided everyone as they've come. And we ask that you would bless us and guide us throughout the rest of this week as we go back to uh, the normal work week. And we just pray that you would continue to be with us and that you would prepare us for your soon coming, for these events that are rapidly approaching, Lord. We may have... May we have implicit faith in your word, Lord, that we would trust it and have faith in it and be moved by it, that it would be a savor of life unto life to each and every one of us. And we ask that you would uh, help us all to have a, a full and complete experience with you, Lord, through the transformation of your word. And we just pray that these, uh, this prophetic narrative would be not just something that we hear, Lord, but it's something that changes us. We thank you for your mercy and your love, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.